you ready? Ready? Okay. All right, good evening. It is May 25th, 2022, 5.30 p.m. and I will call the city, Moorhead City Council meeting uh, to order. Could, um, oh, let's read this first, so. Um, so good evening, everyone. I am Mayor Shelley Carlson. Moorhead City Council welcomes public input on issues listed on the agenda or of general community interest, time, and council permitting. Speakers are limited to three minutes each. If you would like to address the council during the meeting, please fill out a form provided by the city clerk and we will call you up when we get to your item. If comments were submitted to the clerk prior to the meeting via email or phone, those comments will be entered into record. We, the Moorhead City Council, collectively and with gratitude acknowledge the sacred land the city of Moorhead is built upon. We acknowledge the people who have resided here for generations and recognize that the spirit of the Dakota, the Ojibwe, Métis, and all indigenous communities permeate this land. For more information on participation, please visit the council meetings page on the City of Moorhead website at cityofmoorhead.com. And Madam Clerk, could I get a roll call, please? Shelley Dahlquist. Here. Matt Gilbertson. Here. Laura Caroon. Here. Heather Niesemeyer. Here. Deb White. Here. Larry Seldervold. Chuck Hendrickson. Here. Steve Lindos. Here. Mayor Shelley Carlson. Here, and if we could stand, um, if you're able, for the Pledge of Allegiance. You can shut your phones off. <laughs> Jeez, I will do the same. All right. Um, any agenda amendments, uh, City Manager Molly? Yes, Mayor. We have a request to remove item number 15 from the consent agenda. Okay. Um, item 15 is taken off consent. It's so moving on to consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion to approve the consent agenda with amendments. Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. All right, this uh, consent agenda has passed. Um, moving on to recognitions and presentations. The first one is cruise night from Mr. Bill Bartholomew. So uh, Mr. Bartholomew, if you wanna take the podium and let us know what's coming up this summer. Thomas, it's not gonna snow. <laughs> Can't do Can't that. Do that. <laughs> Yes, we are ready to go. Um, I think you guys all got a flyer. Um, we are doing our first night as Veterans Night. We have an honor honorable veteran that will be there, and his car will be highlighted that night. So we decided every year, every month we're going to highlight a special person for a special occasion. Um, we have a couple people that are doing that, so it's kind of cool. Um, we do have a couple new sponsors this year. Swing Barrel will be on our property. So they are going to have refreshments for us out there. We got that pass. Um, our opening band this year is going to be Flamabama. If you remember them, they are the ones that did the song for Officer Mosier. And they will be playing it that night as well. Um, otherwise, all five bands are booked for all five, five months. We're re ready to go. So hopefully we can see everybody. We averaged... Um, 300 cars and in anywhere between 2,500 to 3,000 people last year. Um, and I don't think we had any problem with fights or anything with our police department. They said it went pretty well. So hopefully everything will go well and hopefully we can see you guys out there. Yes. And you said it's the first Thursday of every month. First Thursday of every month. Yep. And starting at what time? 5.30. 5.30 from May to September. September. Wonderful. And if you come early, they usually do. We have guys that show up at 3 o'clock with their cars, the older people. Wonderful. And these are cars that are vintage all the way up to new? Brand new Corvettes. Oh. We had a couple of Ferraris there last year. And I know the Ferrari from Grand Rapids is coming again. We did get three cars out of South Dakota last year, two cars out of Bismarck, and one out of Minneapolis last year. So Wonderful. Getting bigger and bigger. Hopefully we'll keep her going. And what is your goal, Mr. Bartholomew? I think you had told me this last year. Anybody from West Fargo here? We're gonna beat West Fargo cruise night. That's our goal. 
Yep. And last year we did two out of their four nights. So we'll continue to keep pushing and pushing. And um, we'll put in a request for nice weather. So uh, well, it's supposed to be 50 degrees. I talked to Hutch Johnson. He said he'd leave it at that. So he, we're going to let him go get by with it. And we know what happened last year. If you remember, he brought his rain because it did spit a couple times. So, but otherwise, we're looking forward to everybody to come. And this year, the only thing difference is we moved on the north side of the mall because we're waiting for them to start tearing up the main street. And if they don't, then we're going to move back out front. All right. Sounds good. Well, but thank you. You bet. So thank you. So much for coming and yep. look forward to cruise night. And, you know, that's the thing in Moorhead is when you do it one way, one time, and that isn't available, this option won't be available because we are tearing up Center Avenue. And we figure out a different alternative, a different route. We didn't want to go very far. Because yep. the problem we had at West Fargo is they had to go all the way out to the light and they lost a lot of cars. Try to keep it close so we didn't have to go figured on the north side of the mall and uh, Roar's Construction has been really phenomenal working with us, helping us out. They're actually going to let us use their generator at all five bands. Uh, the city of Moorhead has given us their stage, which will be there for the bands at all the time, so we don't have to tear down stuff all the way all the time. That way I can only have to take two days off of work. But thanks, everybody. Thank you. We're looking forward to it. Can't can't wait to uh, get those numbers and share them with Mayor Dardis. <laughs> so, all right, moving on to COVID-19 update. Uh, Kathy McKay, Director of Clay County Public Health, if you want to take the podium, thank you. Good afternoon, thank you, Mayor and City Council members. Appreciate you having me come back. I know the city manager said I have about an hour or hour and a half, but I'll try to be quicker than that. Just kidding. <laughs> then you won't invite me back after that length of time. So um, there it is. So I'm just going to provide um, a little update um, where we are at um, at present. Um, so we'll talk about the where we are in the pandemic, our testing information, and the vaccine clinics as well. So the updates here, the virus, of course, has been circulating, as all of you know. We, had, we have pandemic uh, fatigue. Um, everyone, I'm sure, has pandemic uh, fatigue. But we've been now beyond the two years that we've been circulating, and uh, this virus is mutating. It's uh, uh, becoming new variant strains that we are seeing, alpha, beta, delta, omicron, some of the variant strains uh, they name those after the Greek uh, alphabet to s try to simpl simplify things. Um, sometimes the shifts in the strains are minor, so those are considered the subvariants, um, which is a, a little bit less than the new variant strains. But nonetheless, um, we have BA2 now, which that is the most predominant at this time. It's a sister to the original Omicron variant. Um, so we know that BA2 is um, the most infectious at this time across the United States. About 85 or more percent um, are getting the BA2. So um, this was believed to be a bit more um, infectious than uh, the BA1. BA2 is about 30 to 60 percent more contagious. Um, it does not appear, though, that the BA2 is uh, more virulent, meaning it doesn't cause um, more severe disease than the BA1, at least at this time. Vaccines are still effective for the variant, um, especially in preventing hospitalizations and deaths, and that's pretty important as we look at what this um, COVID can do. So really looking at hospital hospitalizations and regularly and looking at the deaths. We just had one death um, in Clay County in the last two weeks, um, but the deaths have been down. Um, it's still unknown what this impact will be in across the United States in our local area as well. Uh, some of the places across the United States are seeing an increase um, in cases, mostly in the Northeast area. However, the increases have been more gradual, so we're still watching that and anticipating that and hopeful that we won't see the large increases again. Um, we also have the second booster. So those individuals that are over 50 um, can receive a second booster following about four months from their 
original booster, um, and that is with the Pfizer and Moderna. Um, and so those, um, anyone that is over 50 can just receive that. Individuals that are 12 and older or 18 and older, the two different vaccines have the different age range. Moderna is the 18 and older, and the Pfizer is the 12 and older. And those individuals are those that are severely immunocompromised. So they can't come to the public health clinics or other clinics. They have to really be um, evaluated by their physician. We don't have the ability to evaluate their underlying conditions. So those individuals can be evaluated and potentially receive that second booster. Um, so in our local area, um, we have uh, low numbers at this point. We're seeing a, a gradual uptick um, just recently, um, but um, we have look, we're looking at other metrics besides the hospitalizations, deaths, and cases. Um, there also is wastewater surveillance. So may, many of you may have heard about the wastewater surveillance or looking at the virus in wastewater and the University of Minnesota is, is looking at a variety of wastewaters across um, our region. And so that's, that's also showing a little bit of an increase um, in the um, data. M MDH has that posted on the website if you're interested in looking more of that information on wastewater. That's just one of the many um, metrics that we're looking at. So our numbers are low, um, although we've had a little bit of an uptick. Mostly um, we've been seeing the 15 to 20 cases each week. Um, just recently now we have 61 reported cases. So you can see we're, we're moving up a little bit. Um, but we're still considered low transmission in this area. So, so that's really great um, at this point. Uh, Minnesota Department of Health is anticipating that we'll see the ebb and flows um, of the variant. And so we, we may see some increases and then it may reduce again. It's, it's hard to predict how the variant strains are going to, um, or how they're going to impact us, but our hope is that we're not going to see huge increases like we did back in March. Um, the vault testing site, we're seeing a bit more. Um, in our vault testing site, we're seeing a little bit more positivity uh, rates. Um, we're now at, it was at um, like, uh, it's, it's at 1% um, just recently, and now we're up to about close to 6% positivity rate. The vault testing site is going to remain open. Initially, they were talking about closing that at the end of April, uh, but they, I just called the Minnesota Department of Health they contract with the Vault Health Systems to have this site open, and they intend to stay open until the end of June. So that's good news for our community that we can continue to get tested at that Vault testing site, and they will determine, that's not a, a hard um, time frame. the end of June, they'll determine what we're seeing this summer and decide about um, the, the whether they're remaining open or not beyond that date. But at least at this time, you can see the, um, the time frames and they're on our Clay County website as well. So they're still open 11 to 6 and then Sunday 11 to 4. Uh, I know the vault or the testing site in Fargo still remains open. Both vault um, in Moorhead and the testing site in Fargo accepts both Minnesota and North Dakota residents um, equally. So um, there's less numbers of people um, at the vault testing site because we do have other opportunities for testing and um, those are those at-home test kits. So you can order those through MDH, um, and they will send uh, two, well, it's actually four tests. They'll send two boxes with two test kits in each box. So um, every household can order those two boxes. We also have the, the federal government that uh, provides test kits that can be ordered as well. These are no cost to the residents. And then Clay County Public Health received a bit of um, a number of um, test kits through Minnesota Department of Health. We did get those out to some of the um, more, um, oh, some of the higher needs areas where there could be potential to have more COVID spread. Um, some of the homeless populations, we did get those out to some facilities. Um, we also have them um, placed at public areas. For instance, we have some at the library and then we have some throughout the rural county and we'll keep, um, replacing those test kits as they get used up. So we have the ability for people to call us and get test kits through us or um, and order order these and 
use the vault testing site. So there's plenty of opportunity for people to get tested. Uh, the difference with all of the test kits that are out, we don't get any data from that. People can use those test kits, but we're certainly not getting that information. So it's really hard to know um, accurately what does it look like in our community. So we're getting the, the results from the vault site, but the at-home test kits, we are not getting any results from that. Um, so then I'll talk a little bit about, we have our vaccine clinics, which I mentioned um, briefly just a minute ago. Um, and so we have on our website um, our contact information where people can call. Our clinics are usually on Wednesdays, um, 9 to 4, and we provide Moderna and Pfizer, both first, second, and both boosters for those individuals that are eligible for that second booster. So everybody has the... Um, opportunity to receive that vaccine and if people are on if they can't make it on those days we try to accommodate as much as we can initially when um, we started with COVID there was a, a real um, push not to waste any doses so we were um, diligently calling and trying to get people to come in once you open up the vial it only lasts for a few hours and then you have to waste it and and we were in a position where we really that was really um, not acceptable. But at this point in time, um, we've been told that we can waste um, some doses if we need to. If we need to open up the vial, they prefer that we give the vaccine to individuals that come um, and not waste um, or not wait um, to, until we have five or 10 people to give it to. So that's been helpful in the fact that people can get the vaccine when they want it. Um, and it talks about who can get the booster doses, which I had mentioned, those that are 18 and older and 12 and older with underlying health conditions that their physician um, has warranted that they can get the second booster. Uh, but those that are 50 and older can receive that back second booster as long as the time frame has been um, adequate between that first and second dose. So we're still getting people coming in for their primary series, which is great. Um, and many people are coming in for their boosters as well. We do not have vaccine um, for the under five. There's been no um, approval of that emergency youth use authorization yet. They're still working on that. So hopefully um, we will see that in the future. So individuals, um, children under five can receive that vaccine. That might be my hour that's done with. Is anyone <laughs> questions? All right, thank you so much, Kathy. We really appreciate um, you coming in and providing us with this update and, and also the fact that you continually are updating the website um, and also giving presentations to the Clay, County, um, the Clay County Commission. So those who want to tune in for weekly update, I guess you can do that on Tuesdays, but um, probably have you come back maybe in June when Vault closes to see kind of what the next steps would be. So thank you so much again for all your diligent work and everything. Thank you. All right, thanks. All right. So moving on to approval of meeting minutes of the April 11th, 2022 meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes? We're not gonna do questions for during presentations. We have an approval for the meeting minutes of April 11th. So moved. Is there a second for the uh, approval of the meeting minutes? Gilbertson second. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any um, opposed for the approval of the meeting minutes? All right, moving, um, meeting minutes have been approved. And moving on to citizens addressing the council, I believe we have somebody, uh, the executive director for the memory care of the Red River Valley. Uh, Deb, and I don't want to try to pronounce your name because I will probably pronounce it wrong. And during uh -huh. this portion, we do have uh, three minutes for citizens appointing or citizens addressing the council. So Very good. But I will give you some leeway tonight since um, you're the only one. Okay. So. You don't want to give me too much leeway. I can talk <laughs> for a long time about Memory Cafe. It's Memory Cafe of the Red River Valley. So I'm here for three really, really fun, encouraging re uh, reasons. Uh, one is just to, to voice sincere appreciation, and then I have a couple of invitations for you. 
and then I have a box of chocolates for you, Moorhead Growing Chocolates. So um, my name is Deb Call. I am the executive director and co-founder of Memory Cafe of the Red River Valley. We are celebrating our fifth anniversary on May 18th. That's the first invitation. Um, we have been here for five years and have enjoyed tremendous growth. So our organization is involved with, with um, improving the quality of life um, for people who are living with early to mid-stage memory loss for whatever medical reason might be causing it. So we work with people primarily with dementias caused by Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, Alzheimer's uh, vascular dementia, all those different types of dementia. We also work with people who are living with Parkinson's disease, and like I mentioned, strokes. Um, we partner with, with a lot of area community um, partnerships like Valley Senior Services. Um, it, I met with Liz Matheson, Matheson from Mar of Bossart Foundation last week. Um, Pray for Gray, which is an organization that works with people who are, are living with brain tumors. So anything that's causing a progressive memory loss are people that we are interested in supporting. And we do that in five way, four ways. We, we provide community and service uh, projects so that people are reminded that they are still valuable members of our community and that we need them. Uh, we want to engage them in community uh, in, uh, events like the um, Blenders concert at Christmas was a family tradition. Uh, we call it a memory cafe family uh, before COVID. Uh, we did the Fargo Marathon 5K um, as a, something that we did before, the, before COVID again. So we're really actively involved in promoting, promoting a real quality of life for these individuals because most of the time they're hidden and most of the time they're forgotten by us. And they are the people that have really formed our communities. So we are deeply committed to improving the quality of life and to helping them engage, actively engage in meaningful ways in the community. So I have for you a thank you note. We average about 40, 45 people at our meetings, which is really amazing. We have met for this year at the Yumpcom Center. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you um, to, for allowing us to meet here. It's just a beautiful venue. Everybody knows about the Yumpcom Center. They know how to get here. It's, it's beautiful, and we are so grateful for another year. I understand that we we're going to be able to meet here. So I, I brought some pictures of some of our people who meet here. Um, these are pictures that were taken. We work with a lot of intergenerational projects as well. So this was actually um, um, a teacher from Oak Grove. Uh, it's a Moorhead family, um, Deb and golly, now I'm forgetting. I'm nervous. So anyway, the teacher from Oak Grove, they came and they did a, a, a Valentine's project. for. We did thank you notes for the uh, Giving Hearts Day. And so we brought all these students over here and this is these are the uh, students and the teachers that came and the community members that came. So I'll pass those around. And this is a thank you note that was signed by not all of our people, but many of our people um, for, your, for you tonight. So, so we just really want you to number one, know how much we appreciate the opportunity you're giving us to meet in a Moorhead site. We've always been Fargo only, and we've been eagerly waiting to get over to Minnesota side and Moorhead. So this has been a tremendous opportunity and we're so deeply grateful to you for that. Um, at, your ta at your seats, you've gotten a conference flyer and you've also gotten uh, one of our brochures and in the brochure is tucked our schedule so the scheduling it will allow you to see really what we do and how we do it um, this the brochure will give you our meeting information again we're so thankful to have the Yamcom Center for that and this com this community ride conference we call it redefining memory loss because that's really our mission is to redefine memory loss it isn't something that people have to be embarrassed about or ashamed of living with we don't want our people to hide and to be forgotten by us or by anybody. And I gave a, a presentation last week, and I asked my care partners um, what it is, what, what would help you live a more engaged life, and how would you feel supported by our community in a more important way where it really matters to your day-to-day -day life. And one after another, my care partner said, we, we they need education. The community members need education. Our neighbors, our friends, our churches don't know how to interact with us anymore and so they leave us alone they don't invite us they don't know they're not bad people they just don't know what to do with us anymore and so this is Aaron Benito our keynote speaker is one of the best most effective dementia communication coaches in the country and she is coming and I would like to invite all of you if you're business owners or if you're attended church um, EMT staff are inviting we would like everybody in the community to come to this conference because it's very important that these people not feel forgotten or not feel judged, harshly judged and, and neglected by us. And that's how many of them are feeling right now. So we have the power to do that, but it's only if we receive an education. 
and if we're told and coached in practice how to communicate more effectively with these with these families. So um, I have these for you, and if you have any questions or if you need any more, we can certainly send you more electronically. If you have any ideas of how we can penetrate the Moorhead, um, Minnesota community deep, more deeply, love to be able to get your ideas on that. Um, and then lastly, but not, li not um, any less importantly, I have a box of chocolates. These are, I was looking for a Moorhead business like Whitman's on the Minnesota side, and I didn't see Whitman's here, so I asked Tammy Costin. Uh, she's as close to Whitman's as you're gonna find. She could, she could do Whitman. I don't know if any of you know the Costins, but um, we share grandkids. So our son married, married one of the Costin girls, and Tammy made fudge for all of you. So I will just pass the fudge around and just consider this to be a token of our appreciation, the Memory Cafe um, people, how much we appreciate meeting here. So thank you for what you do, and thank you for your, your commitment to the Memory Loss community. Thank you so much uh, for coming, Deb. And um, in my day job, I work at a elder justice organization that we talk a lot about dementia and um, the, the things that Alzheimer's and Lewy body is and the types of diseases that affect people. So it's really exciting to know that there's a memory cafe right here in Moorhead, um, and there's a lot of opportunities to get involved with different organizations. So thank you very much, and um, thank you very much for the fudge too. All right. All right. Moving on to public hearings, do I have a motion to approve the public hearing, open the public hearing for the request of Silver Lining Apartments, so LLC? Move, so move, Niesmeyer. A motion? Second, do I have a second? Karun. Okay, I had a Niesmeyer motion and then I heard Council Member Karun before I heard Council Member Lindos. So all those in favor opening the public hearing signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the public hearing portion has been opened and I will turn it over you, to you, Amy. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, today I am pleased to present to you a project um, called Silver Linings LLC. It is owned and operated by Churches United for the Homeless and Pastor Sue Kesterman, as most of us will probably know. Um, the project is located just north of Cashwise Foods and near the Bright Skies Apartments Project, which is a, a um, an apartment that uh, supports permanent supportive housing. So this new Silver Linings apartment, as you can see up on the screen, um, is affordable and it's for um, housing for 55 and older. And it will include individuals that are facing homelessness, including high priority homelessness and persons with um, disabilities. It's a three story building, 36 units, and it will have a mix of efficiencies and one bedrooms. It will also have some very nice amenities, including a secured entrance to the pantry, a central laundry on each floor, elevator, community room with kitchen, exercise, and computer rooms and a space for some service providers, such as a nurse that may come to the Construction timeline is to um, start as soon as possible, and once they do start, it would, it would take about approximately 12 months to be Although financing is obviously, figuring out those pieces, it's a, it's a very complicated project process with financing. Um, the construction costs are coming in over $7 million, and Minnesota Housing Finance has provided some, um, an award of a, um, some of that funding, a majority of the funding, as well as a GAP, gap loan. Um, but Churches United is uh, still working on fundraising, I believe, and there's some energy grants and whatnot that is also helping with the project. Uh, this project does um, fit very nicely into our multifamily housing um, as a two-year exemption. And um, Chris Miller from Beyond Shelter is here with any other um, questions that you might have, details that I may not um, be able to answer for you. But with that, I open you up, open it up to questions. Okay, since it's a public hearing portion of this agenda item, um, are there any questions from members of the public? Any questions from the public? 
Okay, um, then I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing portion of this agenda item. Mendoza will move closing. Second, Karun. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the public hearing portion of this agenda item is closed. Um, any questions from council in regards to this agenda item? Council Member Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor. Um, one thing I noticed that a lot of the um, housing that we are putting up that's affordable, um, they don't make the uh, tax breaks because they don't have the underground parking. Is there anything that the city can do to change that? Or, you know, where where is that rule? I guess I don't know why why there's a difference between the underground parking and this is not underground, so it doesn't qualify for as much, or as long as a ta tax break for sure. as many years. Certainly, Councilmember Dahlquist. So that is part of an incentive program. Uh, the Economic Development Authority is looking as a committee coming together to review um, existing incentives to support um, whatever the priorities are um, of the council. So that's happening right now. This is a, a two-year exemption application here. I think, are you referring to the four-year? Uh, right, request. right, mm -hmm. because, uh, but to qualify, it has to have the underground parking, because even the uh, the one that's in North Moorhead by the trailer park, it has garages, so it didn't qualify. Right, so, right. I, you know, it just seems like I, w I wish we could give a better uh, tax break for those that are put making affordable housing, you know, every kind of incentive that we could give. Certainly, certainly, yeah, and so that's a policy matter, which is under review now, and um, I don't know if you want to, uh, that, that is going to the Economic Development Authority, that uh, committee is, I, I believe, uh, going to be established, uh, is it a week, is it next Monday? Yep, on Monday that, um, that committee will be um, officially established, and we're um, looking at at least three different meetings with that committee and bring forward um, some recommendations to the EDA board, and will ultimately bring it to this board. And I know that, Deb White, you've um, agreed to be on that committee, and I think that, you know, after Monday, we'll, we'll gather some ways for meeting with that, and she'll bring that, that um, option and ideas. Excellent, thank you. Councilmember Lindas. So I'm gonna pile on, because that was exactly my question. Um, and as a matter of policy, my I mean, we get to vote on whether or not we're gonna give this exemption and can we actually make a change to that recommendation and say, um, in our view, that we could give them a four-year instead of a two-year. And I apologize, I was gonna email this out um, actually on Friday and then I never did over the whole weekend. I would defer to Mr. Shockley. It's a policy matter, so yeah, I mean, if the com council wants to grant an additional exemption, he certainly could. I don't know if, you know, if it's been reviewed in accordance with the policy, but this this is where you get in the policy. This is up to the city council. Amy, do you typically take um, how long of a time to make uh, big policy decisions like this? It's usually over a course of three months or so, usually. It hasn't, you know, our policies, to be fair, haven't been reviewed um, to this degree since we um, approved the Renaissance Zone policy, which was a few years ago now. So, you know, we're due. And what would be the reasons why you take that amount of time to review the policies? Um, to make sure that we hear from everyone that wants to give their ideas. And, and it just, you know, by the time that you take it to the EDA board and then cut to come to city council because their EDA board meets once a month, that usually just works out to be that way. But I mean, if, if, if it's the council's, um, you know, direction to give this, this um, project a, a four-year exemption, I, I would think that that would be un, you know, within your ability. Council Member Lindas. It was a, a two-part question because first I wanted to know if it was possible, and then the second part was if we didn't and we granted a two-year, could we come back and review, especially if you were to change um, policy um, in the interim and get a, give essentially two more years? 
because this this project meets everything except for the parking. I mean, the cost per unit is exceeds the four year exemption. It's just the parking. So Attorney Shockley. Yeah, you could come back later to amend it and add, if, if your policy changed uh, and add an additional two years. And it, uh, from a procedural standpoint, it's probably more appropriate yeah. to come back and amend it if the policy has changed. Yeah, and I, 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 I appreciate that because um, I would rather make policy with time for reflection and input um, versus just saying, gosh, this isn't fair, let's change this right here. And I think the mayor is probably gonna agree that we should wait. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Amy? I, I would just um, recommend that you do <coughs> approve something tonight so that the project is able to move forward. We would be able to come back and amend the, um, the property tax incentive agreement afterwards, but I know that the project wants to have the flexibility of moving forward as soon as possible. I move we approve. I will second that. Okay, so I have a motion by Council Member Dahlquist, second by Council Member Lindos. Um, and I'm assuming that the motion is for the resolution to approve property tax exemption for Silver Linings Apartment. Um, Correct. 9A. Correct. Okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the resolution has been approved and I guess uh, EDA might be reevaluating. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight too. Can I request a point of order? Pardon me? A point of order, how are we going to know to come back to that particular, um, uh, to review it to after review they've it. changed, if they change policy? Yes. Um, Amy, do you wanna quickly address that? Yeah, absolutely, so um, once a recommendation is made by the EDA, I will bring it back to this board um, for review. So that will be a few months from now for the final review but you'll, you'll be, it'll be part of an agenda. So do you need us to ask for that review? No, it's already underway. Okay, thank no, you. No, uh, yep. I'm sorry, Amy, uh, for clarification, not the policy. I, I understood that the policy was already happening, silver linings. How can we make sure that silver linings doesn't get lost in a crack somewhere? But after the policy comes up, how can we make sure that silver linings gets a second review? It's my promise to you that they won't get lost in the cracks. Marvelous. They will, they will, um, they will be brought back. Marvelous, thank you, Amy. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, moving on to number 15. And this would be Mr. Tom Trowbridge. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of council. So this is uh, to approve an agreement with American Crystal Sugar. Uh, we needed an agreement with them anyway to do an easement for this sidewalk, but this agreement is also an opportunity to work with them to have them actually build the sidewalk so we don't have to go through the trouble of, of the bidding process since they're doing work. So the background on this is the, the city had been doing some planning in the downtown area and it was recommended that the city make a better sidewalk connection between the uh, Moorhead Center Mall area and the Yemcomst here because uh, Yemcomst has a parking lot but with the events that they do, a lot of the events can use a lot more parking and, and the, the mall with the ramp and everything has more parking and it's an opportunity to kind of combine the parking from the mall area to the uses that would happen here. And so that was the desire and we did come up with an estimate last year of about a hundred thousand dollars and as a result the council did include that in the budget. Uh, it was a capital improvement fund budget uh, for this project to be done this year. And we were working on the design, and at the same time, Crystal Sugar actually happened to be bringing some site plan for review to us because they wanted to redo their parking lot. Since we can't do the sidewalk without going through their driveways, and they're going to be doing the driveways and parking lot, 
it just was a very good opportunity to partner with them on this. And they were a little further ahead of us in their site work for design. So they've actually received their bids. And so this is kind of a, if we can get this uh, agreed to, it's a really good opportunity to kind of work together and get something done in the most efficient way possible. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? Councilmember Dahlquist. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Tom. I guess that's why I did take it off, because I wanted to get explanation um, and make sure that, because um, my question was 100,000 for the, the sidewalk, and you said it's not just that sidewalk, it's the other stuff that's involved. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that that, <laughs> you know, that the plan was explained so it wasn't, <laughs> you know, like $100,000 for a sidewalk, <laughs> you know. Um, that and that, um, the plan for future events would have, you know, access to parking to get to the yam comps, because that is a terrible way to, to get across. And you said there is plans to have protected crossing further down on, on Third Street too. So I guess I just wanted to make sure that people knew that there's more involved than what's on here, but you know, for time, you know, you made it as as easy to read and quick, you know, and so, Thank you so much for explaining what what all else is involved in that. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve reimbursement and easement agreement for this construction of the Third Street North Sidewalk. Happy to make that motion. Do you have a second? I'll second, Karun. Okay, I have Linda and Karun. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion carries. All right, and moving on to number 18, uh, the resolution to amend the resolution of 2021-0308-19, a request to the legislature for the local option sales tax authorization. And I will turn this over to Ms. Bodie. Thank you, Mayor Carlson. Um, this is an amendment to an amendment, um, but we're looking at, we're reviewing the financial uh, terms of a bond issue for the community center and regional library project. I think all of you have probably been to the listening sessions and seen the momentum building for this project and the excitement of our residents. Um, the first listening session on uh, April 5th was attended by, I'd estimate, probably 100 people or so. And I wasn't sure that we would get that level of engagement at the second listening session, but we had about that same number of people and it was really fun to see people, you know, really dreaming about what the project could be. But when we uh, approached the legislature with our request, um, we had a total budget and we were required to, required to also have financial projections on how long it would take to repay the bonds necessary to build the library community center. And um, as you also may be aware, the, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates this past year and are expected to do so again uh, before we would sell these bonds in 2023. And Baker Tilly, our financial advisors, have reviewed the assumptions made for the bonds and felt that we um, did not have a sufficient interest rate given these increases um, in interest rates. And so um, it would take an additional eight years to repay the bonds if the interest rates are where Baker Tilly predicts them to be next um, summer and fall when we are, are preparing for a bond sale should the voters approve the, uh, the sale, local option sales tax. It is late in the legislative session to be requesting such a change, but we know there are at least four or five other cities in this same position. And so we've brought it to Senator Eakin and Representative Keeler and also Chair Marquardt and uh, are working on uh, we have bill language drafted to make that change. We have, uh, as of this afternoon, we have bill jackets and I hope that we get bill numbers tomorrow and could perhaps get in a hearing um, maybe on Thursday. 
So um, things are moving fast, and um, we are hopeful that this change will be made. It's been 18 months since the legislature. It will have been 18 months between the legislative approval and the vote by our residents. And we really want to present a sound financial plan to them that we know um, that we can reasonably count on to pay these bonds back without having to find an alternate revenue source. So um, to document the council's um, uh, uh, authorization of this amendment, we would like to ask you to pass this amendment to the resolution that you passed last year for the legislature so that we can hand them a, a, a formal action by the city council if you so choose. All right, any questions or comments for Ms. Bodie? All right, with that, I would entertain a motion, uh, motion to uh, approve uh, number 18. I'll make a motion to approve. White seconds. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, the motion passes. So that will be helpful um, as we're going down to the cities this week for Moorhead Day at the Capitol, so. All right, moving on to number 19, Mayor, Mayor and Council Reports. Do I have any council member who have any reports to share? Council Member Lindas. Thank you, Mayor Carlson. Um, so I, I think you probably, or, or, or our city manager will probably talk about Earth Day, but um, we have a lot of really cool um, Earth Day events coming up. Um, hopefully they're gonna be hot by then. Um, the weather will, will shift. Um, and I'll let you guys talk about that. Um, just a reminder from the presentation, um, the vaccination is the number one way to protect yourself and also our community. And so um, if you have not gotten vaccinated or boosted, um, please do so. Um, and it's a great way to also protect those in our community that aren't able to get vaccinated. Um, so Metrocog um, had a meeting um, last week and um, myself, Councilmember Gilbertson and Councilmember Hendrickson um, were attending. And there's a lot of um, uh, studies coming up and the b biggest thing that's kind of moving forward is because our uh, metro area has grown, we're gonna be moving into a different funding structure. Uh, so we're gonna be a transportation uh, management area. That's what I was looking up the exact name of what it was called. Um, uh, and so there is there's some ramifications for how Minnesota and North Dakota Department of um, Transportation fund um, objects. Um, there's huge opportunities in um, how and what we can do. And as an area, Metrocog, I think is very much interested in trying to look at those projects that individually might not kind of rise to the, per, um, the level and get funded, especially some of the, what I would say, quality of life um, type of um, projects, uh, bridges over rivers that aren't for cars, but are for bikes and pedestrians and people and dogs cats maybe, um, and those, those are things that are fantastic opportunities. And so I would really encourage people to be engaged. There's a um, metropolitan bike and pedestrian um, surveys that are, that are going out. And so these ideas that people have can actually percolate and get funded um, underneath these new um, uh, streams. Uh, you know, the, the Heartland Trail, um, that would be fantastic to hook up. And it's not just for Minnesota, it's for North Dakota and Fargo residents because they're all waiting and would like to have more ways to get across the river and onto trail systems into Minnesota. And so it's a great opportunity to partner with um, our metropolitan colleagues across our metro area. That's it. All right, thank you. Any other council members? Uh, council member Gilbertson. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, it's my annual uh, shout out to Nate Ockery and the assessor department. We had our board equalization last Thursday and we had zero residents upset with their taxes or increase or decrease in taxes. So just a shout out to them. They do a great job, handle all the complaints or questions beforehand. So appreciate it. 
All right, any other council members who have any reports to update on? Okay, I just have a few. Um, just wanted to give a shout out to Minn Kota Recycling. Um, I attended their ribbon cutting for a new baler that they um, have purchased, and it was also kickoff for Earth Week. Um, and speaking of Earth Week, I, I was able to speak at the West Central Initiative um, at their spring convivium. And uh, I know that was well attended also by some city staff along with council member Lindas and city manager Molly and uh, assistant city manager Mike Reitz. I'm trying to think who else was there. there were, and yes, council member Karun was there um, and a whole bunch of city staff was also in attendance. Um, it was very well attended and it was offered both in person and virtually and I don't, I think they had well over 100 people attend. Um, and as far as the listening sessions, we um, had, like uh, Ms. Bodie stated, we had very um, um, a large number of people attending both listening sessions. And now what will happen is that the information gathered will be ranked and we'll be able to determine what are the, the needs that kind of rose to the top as far as the wants and desires of the citizens of Moorhead, and then those will be put into a rendering. So people have an idea of what the new community center library would look like and what it would contain in terms of what we have heard from the public. Um, there is still an opportunity to provide input online, um, but at some point we will kind of cut, cut that off so that we um, have a good, um, a large number of input. So that will be the next step in um, getting the yes in November to really create a project that is in downtown Moorhead that is not just an economic development project, but it is truly a legacy project for the city of Moorhead and is something that could tra change the trajectory of our community um, for generations to come. So that is all I have for my updates. On to me. On to you. Super. Go ahead, Thank City you, Manager Mayor. Molly. Uh, the, okay, yeah, an update on um, the Earth Week and uh, uh, cleanup days. So with the weather and everything, everything was pushed back one week. So um, this Restore Moorhead initiative right now, um, or as of the end of last week, had 126 individuals signed up that have been assigned to help clean up in 10 parks, uh, the Homestead Trail and the Downtown Trail. So uh, that's just underway. Uh, uh, the, we also have the um, park and path cleanup projects, um, which are the ones that are rescheduled uh, to next week. So thank you all council members for your willingness to participate and just for folks that are listening or watching. So on Monday, May 2nd from 4 to 7 p.m., council members White and Selgebold will be removing buckthorn from Gooseberry, thank you. Uh, Tuesday, May 3rd, 4 to 7, uh, Council members uh, Dahlquist and Gilbertson will be removing buckthorn trash and food forest maintenance at MV Johnson Park. On um, Thursday, May 5th, um, Council members Niesemeyer and Council member Karoon and my favorite Girl Scout troop will be um, uh, picking up trash on the 20th Street bike path in Romkey Park from four to seven. And on Friday, May 6th, four to seven, Council members Hendrickson and Lindas We'll be cleaning up trash at Queens Park um, and then finishing up the 20th Street uh, bike path. So thank you all for doing that. Um, the mayor mentioned um, all sorts of things that staff and council members and other folks uh, eh, attended at Concordia, at Minn Kota, at MSUM, all around our community. Um, cleanup days in Moorhead then also initiate on uh, May, May 2nd through May 13th. So the something for all to remember when you put trash out on the, the front, cleanup days are on the regular garbage day opposite recycling. So if it's recycling, it's garbage and recycling. If not, and I think council member Lindas had mentioned that you could use your recycling container for garbage on cleanup day. Yes, thank you. So, and then, um, you know, sometimes it's good to just take a moment to just kind of stop and reflect about what it means to be part of community. And, you know, some of that is um, being there when, with others when wonderful things happen and it also requires us to be there when um, others are in need. And so this weekend our neighbors to the north in Crookston and Polk County um, face some severe or some significant flood risk. Um, a call was made and we had um, in uh, storage in North Moorhead uh, sandbags that would have been made in 2019, um, a good number of them that um, 
were uh, sent, um, frankly, close to 15,000 bags. And there was, I don't know if anybody saw some of the videos on uh, Facebook or anything like that, but there were four trucks that were moving in. And, you know, we've been there before, and it was just such an honor to be there and to be able to serve and stand and support our neighbors in that great time of need. And so, um, very humbling and an honor um, uh, to, be, to be there. And just wanted to send a big thank you to everyone that came out, and um, boy, especially folks from the street department that came out with some forklifts, and from the MPS crew also that helped load these things up on on trucks. It's, it's just something that we do in this part of the country that is just very incredible. Uh, we're really good at this. <laughs> and so, as the mayor, when I called her this weekend to give her a heads up, said, she said, something to the effect of, well, that's good, because we never want to use those darn sandbags ever again. So, um, thank you all for, you. Was that, is that about right? Or did I, yeah. something like that? Yeah, yeah, that was great. I love it. We're, we're love building this idea. little project. Um, <laughs> called the Diversion Project, so we shouldn't ever need sandbags again. <laughs> yes. Let's give them to somebody who can use yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, very nice. So I just wanted to report that that was happening. It looks like the floodwaters are starting to recede um, in Crookston and Polk County too. So all very good news for our region. Thank you. All right, thank you, City Manager Molly. Um, moving on, I don't believe we have an executive session tonight. So um, any new business? Okay, moving on to the no new business. Um, and are there any citizens who wish to address the council? Do not see any in the audience. So with that, we are adjourned for the night. Thank you, everyone.